Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our October meeting day at HSA. Welcome our interstate visitors and the country people who can't be here this night. Remember, it's always good to come along and have our physical meeting as well. We have a few guests tonight, especially our speaker, Garrett Russell. You'll speak much more later. We've got uh, Diane Oliver, who's with him, and Ewan McLeod, who's a new member tonight, joining tonight. And uh, just a few general things. Thank Archerville Airport Corporation for the use of this lovely room. And uh, I'm going to mention about the Caboolture Aero Club's Open Hangers Day in a couple of weeks' time, Saturday the 13th of November. The aim of highlighting historic aircraft owned by the Caboolture Aero Club members, the many vintage and veteran aircraft which call Caboolture home. It's only open to Caboolture Aero Club members and their guests and possibly fly-ins from other aero clubs. They'll have a sausage sizzle and it'll be planned as a low-key social day for members, guests and their families. The Aero Club have agreed for us to have a small AHSAQ display at the, at the clubhouse there, where we can make ourselves known to potential members and sell some books, magazines, etc. AHSAQ members can come as guests of the club, the Kabulchi Club. So far, several members have volunteered to look after our display and several more would be welcome. What's in it for you? Well, our members can take this chance to see up close and personal and admire the many and varied aircraft that are based at Caboolture. We have several members of AHSAQ who are also members of Caboolture Aero Club. Ian McDonnell, Clue Mason, Ray Vallon and myself. Do we have any other members of AHSA who are members? I'm not quite sure. Anyway, um, we also have Garrett Russell, who's here at Speaker Night as a member of that club. Anyway, see me or email me if you'd like to attend the, the Caboolture Aero Club on Saturday 13th of November. Our next meeting, Friday 26th of November, Ross Parker, owner pilot of Wiraway A2695 VHMPW, will be talking on the Wiraway, an Aussie icon. Ross's Wiraway is one of the many aircraft to see up there at Caboolture. Tonight, as well as having members and guests participating here, we're zooming so that our AHSA colleagues in the country and in state can join us. Tonight though, Garrett Russell, a very experienced Gliding Federation of Australia instructor who will be giving us a short history of gliding from a perspective of one vintage airport. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest speaker. And uh, good evening uh, among, to everyone here and uh, Dave Goldsmith, who I know is coming in on the Zoom. Um, I, uh, I owe a thanks to Dave for some of the photos here and I may as well get rid of that early. The, I was gonna say it at the end, but Dave and the, uh, the museum at Bacchus Marsh uh, people at Caboolture, particularly Kevin Rodder, who's one of our, our members who has uh, done a lot of archival work, uh, and uh, members of a, a Facebook group uh, uh, dedicated to the uh, Schneider, Edmund Schneider gliders in Australia. Thanks to all of those for the, some of the photos, the better photos maybe, and the worst photos of my own that you'll see here. So I've come here to talk to an audience who I wasn't sure how much you know about gliding. Let's assume you don't know anything. Um, and then we'll be on an even keel uh, to talk about gliding in, in Australia, particularly uh, Queensland. Uh, and it is, oh, that's, that's good. Uh, no, that's fine. Uh, it's a fairly old story. Well, for a start, why, why did I choose that, uh, uh, that as my intro slot? Oh, excellent. Um, uh, image to talk about gliding. All the pilots know. Gliding in progress. Yeah. Gliding, in progress. gliding in progress. Yeah, that's the dumbbell sign. Uh, if you see that at an airfield, gliding is in progress. Uh, and gliding has been in progress in Australia for 112 years, uh, month after next. Um, it's, uh, I'll just make sure I've got that. There it is, Stanwell Park, December. 1909 and George Taylor uh, with a glider he'd designed himself um, had a team of people there in the breeze I believe he was at something like 16 feet and he uh, called for his crew to um, untether him and uh, that was the first heavier than air flight in Australia so uh, uh, flight of any kind so gliding is the origin of, of heavier than air flight in Australia and just to um, put some cream on the cake, his wife Florence flew it that same day. So first female pilot as well. First female pilot in Australia happens to be a glider pilot. Uh, 
Sorry, 1909, yeah. Uh, and Queensland wasn't too far uh, behind. Um, I'll just go, there's, that is a uh, uh, reproduction of, of replica of the uh, Taylor Glider, which is uh, in the uh, Gliding Museum at Bacchus Marsh. Well worth going to see. Uh, there were three of these that were built uh, on commission from the Gliding Federation in 2009 to celebrate the anniversary of that signal event. Uh, and Lawrence Hargroves was involved, as you can see, with uh, the, uh, some detail in the, uh, in the tail, the box kite. And the interesting thing is I, I only discovered today in some reading that this glider, which is the first thing that flew in Australia, uh, there had been people flying in Europe earlier in gliders, but this is about 10 years ahead in design terms of those. The, this is more similar to what came up in Europe uh, 10 years later. Um, and Queensland followed fairly quickly. It was December 20, uh, not 20, 19, uh, 10, that uh, a chap named uh, McLeod, Tom McLeod, he, um, he launched a glider just down the road here at 17 Mile Rocks. And, uh, and I do know that there was, uh, in 1912, a St. Lucia Gliding Club, um, which they must have flown gliders somewhat like this. Um, and uh, the story I'm going to tell you is from here, uh, in the first place, the first part, the development of gliding that went from this, this uh, start, which is, fairly rickety, as you can see, uh, to also in the museum, 50 years later, um, 1957, that's a German glider called the Phoenix. It's famous because it is the first fiberglass fuselage aircraft in the world commercially produced. Um, and it, 1957, it came on the market. 1951 was when design uh, development began on that project. So it's 70 years old um, now. And um, I think that's a pretty extraordinary story that in, um, in really 40 years uh, uh, to go from that to that. How did it start? Where did it start? Oh, it even got a stamp. Sorry, I forgot about that. That's where it started. That's uh, the Palace of Versailles. And it actually started here in the Hall of Mirrors because that's where the Treaty of Versailles was signed. And the Treaty of Versailles, among many other things, uh, restricted Germany to um, uh, heavily on, on powered aircraft. Germany was, I believe it's the direct one was no single engine powered aircraft. So from 1919, um, if you were a young air-minded person in Germany, that was it. That's your lot, mate, which was the same as everyone else had by those days. That's primary gliders that were um, uh, typically, that's a bungee launch, as you can see. Uh, if you can see the, the two lines coming from the bow where they've got a couple of football teams pulling him down a slope and the flying is restricted to something that's measured in seconds uh, more than hours and, uh, and feet more than hundreds of feet on the slope. Slope soaring was about as good as it got. Um, and that the impetus that uh, German pilots got out of that, that restriction um, is what led Germany to, uh, to develop a whole new era of gliding. And this is where uh, the center part of it, um, that's uh, Wasserkuppe in Germany, uh, which as you can see, it's a slope. Now it's a, a paved uh, airstrip as well, but that's the heart of, of gliding. And the, um, uh, the, uh, the museum, I'll show you some photos in a minute, is, is the, the, the sole, it's, it's like uh, Hawaii for surfing. Uh, and I've, I'm happy to say I've flown there. Um, the museum is uh, an amazing thing that documents the growth that happened in a very, very short time. By very short time, on those slopes in 1920, um, they held the first German national gliding competition. 
the winner uh, set two records. Duration, two minutes. Distance, two kilometers. That's 1920. In 1931, at the same site, uh, there was an international competition that uh, the winner uh, set an, a record at the time, 272 kilometers flying from Munich to, uh, to somewhere in the Czech Republic. And uh, by not too long after that, the German government had got behind gliding in, in a big way. There were 50,000 glider pilots registered in Germany. They are the people who took gliders from that, the primary glider, through to the development of a, a nacelle to make it a little more aerodynamic, to gliders that look like that, starting to look more like modern gliders. And that is, you're talking about a, a 10 year time span there. Um, and uh, the, the one in the foreground, we'll come back to that later because that's very, got a very big important part of our, our, our story. Uh, and the pioneers from that era uh, celebrated in that, uh, in that museum. I'm only going to talk about two who kind of resonate with us. Alexander Schleicher, uh, whose company, Schleicher, is still based at Poppenhausen, just on the other side of the slope there. Uh, and they have developed to the point now where that is the ASH 31, which is their latest single seater. Um, 54 to one glide ratio. And a Frenchman last August flew one of those from somewhere around there, down the Alps, across the Alp Maritime, across to Corsica, across to Italy, back up and back home in one flight. Uh, I don't know the distance, uh, they, they were just crying about that flight, but then, and, and the significant part, as you could imagine, is the overwater. Yeah. Not once, but twice. Um, quite an achievement. Uh, so again, 70 years on from the, uh, uh, from, uh, the, the first fiberglass glider, we've got to that. Second one who worked closely with Schleicher, Edmund Schneider. Uh, we'll talk about him a lot. Uh, he came from a place called Grunau. He lived, had a factory. Uh, that's his factory in Grunau, uh, which uh, ultimately, this is in the 30s, um, was employing pretty much the whole district of, of Grunau in glider production. Uh, and one of his early, uh, early uh, successes was a one off, not a production glider, but a one off specifically to do you know, record breaking flights, which only exists nowadays in model because there was only the one, but, uh, but it, uh, now where did it go? No, I didn't, I didn't record what, what flights it did, but they, you know, the, the record flights were going cra crazy and crazy. Just to give you an idea, going back to that, up there, that scale, 50 kilometers, still to this day, so this guy has flown well, there, 50 kilometers is the distance you have to fly to get Silver Sea badge in gliding. So uh, things have moved on quite a bit. But Schleicher's, uh, not Schleicher, Schneider, um, he also, as well as doing things like that, uh, that uh, mower, uh, designed and built the uh, Grunau Baby, which is the in many ways, it could claim to be the most significant uh, glider in history um, because more than 6,000 um, 6, of these were built um, by, by uh, Schneider and under license in up to 20 countries. It, uh, uh, there it is, slope soaring in the Grunau area. Um, and it has the... Uh, the uh, uh, significance of, of being one of the few aircraft that served both sides in World War II. Um, of course, it was used by the Germans as a training aircraft, and it was impressed into service by at least the United States forces. So, uh, so the Grunau uh, is a very significant uh, aircraft in gliding history, and a lot of people got their wings in that. 
And at that same time, around about the, um, uh, the towards the end of the 30s, that's a uh, uh, started life as a DFS Mesa uh, designed by another German group. It's got Olympic rings on it, you see there, um, because it became called the Olympia when it was chosen in 1936 as the winner of a one design competition for the glider that was going to be the mount for competition in the 1940 Olympics. Um, 1940 Olympics didn't happen. So they basically went into, uh, uh, into limbo, but a lot of gliding did happen, of course. There was a lot of development in gliders in the 1940s in the large troop carrying variety. Um, which uh, began in 1940. Once again, the Germans were in the lead when uh, in their, uh, their rampage across Europe in Belgium, there was a, what was regarded as an impregnable fort, uh, even, um, even in Mao, um, which was a fort which was very, had very large walls, but they didn't worry too much about its protection above because then it had it was something like 400 metres across. So the Germans, as part of their advance going through Belgium, landed some troop carrying gliders on the top of the fort, went down through the, the vents and took the fort with very little effort with a small number of men, and then went on uh, from there. So that inspired a lot of, uh, a lot of air forces around the world and, and aircraft designers uh, to come up with things like the Horsa. Uh, that is a, uh, that's at Pegasus Bridge, um, which is of course famous as the location of the first uh, allied action on D-Day. Um, the first, the legend is that the first two allied uh, servicemen to hit French soil on D-Day because it's just after midnight were the pilots of a horser who were tasked with landing their, their load of troops as close to that bridge as possible. And they did it but in doing it, they, uh, they crashed into a dirt wall and they were ejected forwards out of the cockpit. So when they hit uh, French soil to become the first allied troops, they were both unconscious. So, um, and the Americans, they also had the, uh, what the Brits called the Hadrian, the Waco CG4, which the reason I've gone into this is in our part of the world, uh, I'm not aware of any um, glider operations. Uh, because where, where do gliders fit into a battle that's fought on jungle-clad islands? However, that did go into, uh, into it was deployed on a jungle-clad island in 1945. Um, has anyone heard of the, um, uh, it was a DC-3 uh, crash, crash in Ballium Valley, and it was called the Gremlin Special. Um, the... Uh, the Yanks, the war had moved on. The Americans literally were doing in these, these uh, closed in valleys in, in, uh, in New Guinea, um, uh, joy, joy flights. They were doing tours, aerial tours of the valley. And a DC-3 with about 22 on board went into the side of one of these valleys. There were survivors, including a, a very attractive young uh, um, uh, army officer who was, uh, who was in um, the women's uh, thing. Problem was, how were they going to get them out? Uh, it was an inaccessible valley. The solution in the end was that they, they found in the Southwest Pacific some actual gliders and some pilots and then took the time to train them and the DC-3 crews to, uh, to mount an operation, dropped parachutes into the, uh, into the valley. They cleared enough of a strip uh, to get a glider in and snatch by that technique. And that's how they got the people out. Um, and this is where we go into, I said something, some things intersect with me. I have a very slight personal connection with that because there was a journalist who parachuted in um, with his camera to document that snatch. Uh, and I worked with his wife in the seventies. That's, don't know whether anyone knows about that. That's yeah. Australia's trip carrying glider. The, uh, the uh, de Havilland Australia, uh, uh, well, they call it the G2. 
So it's fascinating to think that if the Yanks hadn't been able to find any of their Wacos in Southwest Pacific, that may have actually been deployed, but it didn't happen. Okay, end of war. That's the beginning of what I consider to be a golden era. We've just been through, a, a, call it a golden era of growth in, in gliding uh, mainly out of Germany. But in Australia and elsewhere, we had thousands of young men coming home. They've been trained, they've got some training, they've got a taste for flying. They wanna continue flying. And again, just a personal thing, I've got to put in uh, 75 Squadron at Milne Bay because um, I have a very slight personal connection with that as well, which I won't go into now. Um, they were coming home in their droves and they wanted to go flying. Uh, so gliding was a, was a good, affordable and accessible option. And the gliding clubs that were in, around Australia were just these little grassroots operations built around that sort of ridge soaring, you know, it was the primary gliders. Uh, there, was, there was huge scope for things to, to grow, uh, but you had to get these people uh, organised. There was another reason to be organised, and that was that uh, gliding by its nature had, radar had only just been invented, but it had gone under the radar all its life up until then, because they were flying low, you know, it wasn't too much, but government was starting to get interested. And it wasn't just uh, the young men who wanted to fly, it was the young women as well. There was this large number of people who wanted to get in the air. They wanted to fly without big brother breathing over their shoulders. So if they wanted to go and ridge saw, that's on the North shore of Noosa, I believe, and land in the surf, they, they could. So um, the, all these little disparate grassroots gliding clubs from all over Australia got together and formed in 1949, the Gliding Federation of Australia, which was set up to run gliding as much as they could. And uh, uh, it, uh, it saw enormous growth, of course, in that time. Um, there, was a, there was a big need for, for gliders. The Gliding Federation was answering that. And they were acutely aware that, um, that you needed someone to design the gliders. Um, there wasn't a lot on offer. That's a state-of-the-art British trainer of the time. That also is one. They're both Slingsby's T21, T31. Uh, and uh, some of the nascent gliding clubs that were in the GFA were even designing their own. That's a unique Australian designed and built glider called the Zephyrus. Only one exists. It was uh, designed and built by members of Beaufort Gliding Club, at, at, again, at Bacchus Marsh. I found it very interesting because uh, getting in the, the instructor seat is like getting into the back of a New York cab. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the most inspired thing that I think uh, uh, the GFA did in its early years, and the, uh, the first president was Jack Eagleton. Uh, he and others, they, um, and they had competition. They, there was a competition from Canada for what they wanted to do. They got onto Edmund Schneider in Germany. Uh, he was available. They knew that and the Canadians knew that because by 1945, Grunau, where his factory was, was on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. Edmund and his, uh, particularly his son, Harry, they were displaced people. Um, they had nowhere to go. They were actually building boats on the shores of Lake Constance between Germany and, and Switzerland. Uh, he was still had his head in the air. And the, uh, uh, that's, that's Edmund at that time. And Harry, looking like a younger Edmund, um, and uh, Jack Eagleton, I believe, was the one who sponsored them. They, they approached them to migrate to Australia and would give them support, and, uh, and they were sponsored and came out to Australia, to uh, Melbourne in the first place. And then a, uh, uh, a guy named John Witherspoon in Adelaide wanted a glider built. He provided them with some uh, factory space uh, where they could go over to uh, Parafield to establish a glider um, um, operation. And 
they one among the things that uh, that Edmund did in those years was that's the Grunau, the Grunau baby that was pre-war. He designed uh, the three, four, and five versions of that, which were um, they had closed in canopies. They were improvements of that. Uh, I think only one of these was ever built in Australia, but the rest of them were all built in Germany. So there's there's there you go in the in the early 50s, late 40s, they came out in 51. Um, we had the Germans building a glider that was, we could say, was designed in Australia. He also designed that, the ES-49, a two-seat uh, trainer, which was built by Schleicher in Germany. And he had designed that while he was still in Germany. And uh, the aircraft that he built for John Witherspoon was his first all-Australian glider. That was the 49B. It's essential. It's it's quite a different redesign of the ES49, um, and that uh, uh, that's what kicked off the Schneider uh, era in Australia. The 49 was also uh, sold as a, as a kit or uh, or plans and built by clubs, and it was called not the Kangaroo but the Wallaby, uh, and there were about eight Wallabies built, I believe. Uh, and Schneider then went on Edmund and Harry as a design team, designing aircraft like the uh, the Nymph. Um, that's the uh, the Kingfisher. Uh, design gliders like that until 1960, uh, when Edmund went back to Germany to uh, take a place in the gliding manufacturing businesses in Germany. Harry um, then became the sole designer out of this um, very effective design team. Uh, and uh, one of his first designs was the um, Arrow. It is the S-59 Arrow. So not only uh, the, you know, uh, Harry's first design here, but the first Australian designed and built glider to fly in a world competition. That flew with distinction in, uh, not that aircraft, but that design in uh, Argentina in 1963. At the same time, or around about the same time, they built in Australia under license from Schleicher, the KA-6, uh, which was a very successful single seat glider of the 60s. That's uh, ESKA-6 numbers one and two, both of which live at Caboolture. Uh, ESGRS is uh, the one I have and Kevin Rodder, uh, is the owner of uh, GRV number two. Uh, differences between the, the license built Australian one and the, uh, the German ones, you see that? The Pito is in a solid tube, which makes a very nice lifting handle. <laughs> and similarly, down here on the fuselage, just barely on either side, a uh, couple of solid metal lifting handles that I can tell you having manhandled one of these and one of the German ones around the field is very, very practical. Uh, and uh, there's another view of it. And this is really, it's just me being indulgent. That's a way of getting my, uh, my Chiltern Olympia, which is, we talked about the Olympia before. We also have one of the two Chiltern Olympias in Australia at Caboolture. Uh, but we're getting to the most significant Schneider glider of all, absolutely. The ES-52 Kookaburra, short wing Kookaburra, two seat side by side trainer. That, uh, that's uh, an example that's in Alice Springs uh, Air Museum. Um, an immensely uh, uh, important and significant design because it was designed by Edmund and, Sh and Harry in consultation, close consultation with GFA. So they were getting feedback on what the clubs out there wanted and they were incorporating that into their designs. Um, and uh, uh, they, uh, they built something like 44 kookaburras. Uh, and they, were, they could take a bit of punishment, like... Uh, uh, no, no, no. Just, just one field short of the airfield, I think. <laughs> uh, it was one wing, the short wing cooker. 
which made for an interesting trailering uh, solution. Um, there was a later development, long wing kookaburra, which had two wings. And uh, there's Harry. Um, he, he had his own career as well as a, as a great glider pilot uh, in Australia. Uh, and that was a, uh, an event in New South Wales in the 80s called the uh, Cooker Convention with Kays. Uh, I'm not sure how many, there are about eight or 10 there. Uh, so that, that's you know, the man responsible or one of the two men responsible for, uh, uh, for this huge um, factor in advancing gliding in Australia. I don't know how many people did their first solo in one of those. And Schneider even became part of the Australian culture. But they weren't finished yet. This is Harry's. This, what you're looking at there, is, has got to be the, the, uh, the ultimate, the epitome of the wood and fabric aircraft, or certainly glider. Um, we'll uh, allow the mosquito to have a place there somewhere as well. Um, that is the ES-60 boomerang. Uh, sorry, wrong button. See the tail, boomerang shaped tail. Uh, and essentially it, its design brief was to make something a bit bigger, a bit tougher, a bit heavier than the K6 to handle Australian thermals. And uh, that's, that's at Gympie, that one, uh, which is, it's been restored. I'm not sure whether it's back in the air yet but a beautiful, beautiful glider. And it became the second glider to represent Australia in design and construction and uh, sporting terms at a world's, that's South Cerny in, uh, in the UK. But, and that's uh, what that one is, is called a super arrow. It's a boomerang with the, uh, without the boomerang. More, more uh, normal tail arrangement there. But that's giving a good, um, uh, indication of the headwinds that were facing the Schneider business, um, which were obvious here. We were talking about that before. Lurking behind the wooden glider built by Schneider is the fiberglass glider. That's the glass flugel uh, standard label, H103 label kind of successor of the, uh, of the Phoenix and, uh, and one of the most successful single seat gliders. The reason it's significant in this story is that at that time after the boomerang, Schneider went out of being uh, essentially being a manufacturer into being an importer. And the, the LaBelle was one of several gliders that they imported and distributed to Australia. So a fundamental change in in their business and uh, at the same time as the, the five glass revolution was really settling in in Australia. One last step in the Schneider story. Um, so they, they spent the 70s basically importing gliders that, like that and servicing them rather than building new ones. But in 1984, Harry designed um, the platypus, which is a uh, two-seat trainer version, more or less based on the on the boomerang and fiberglass. This was this is the prototype, the only one that was built. Um, so it's not all glass. There were there were elements that in manufacture would have become been glass. Uh, I think that's an amazingly futuristic-looking glider for 1984, and it was never produced because there was not enough uh, funding, not enough wherewithal in Australia to, um, uh, to for it to proceed. Harry at that time uh, was not getting any younger and uh, he would have had to in really throw his whole life savings into it and chose to retire instead. So to me, that's a lost opportunity for Australia um, in the same, vein as the uh, the Victor Air Tourer CT4, uh, you know, that was produced, designed in Australia, but ultimately uh, made money for New Zealand. Uh, I, uh, that, that to me is a, a tragic end to 
a great, great story because that's from 1951 till 84, the, uh, the Schneider name was dominant in, uh, in Australian gliding. Um, and that just, I think, underlines it. That's a two seat sure. side by side. Brought, uh, no, not electric. That's not electric, but uh, probably is by now. 2006. 1984, 2006. There was another headwind that was uh, going to uh, uh, upset uh, the Schneider business model as well. Uh, and it's lurking there in the background. And it's from an entirely different direction and uh, materially different. That's not fiberglass, that's metal. That's the Blanik. Yeah. Blanik from Czechoslovakia. Uh, designed in the mid 50s as a uh, as a two seat trainer uh, using a lot of Soviet aerospace technology and uh, after the boomerang the most numerous two seat trainer in Australia I believe 36 were imported by uh, and maybe more 36 are currently on the register another great uh, great legendary name in Australian gliding Bill Riley. Uh, Bill was a um, uh, uh, product of the, uh, the era that I talked about. He came back from uh, flying in the Air Force, obviously with a taste for flying and an entrepreneurial attitude. And he started in the uh, late 60s or 70s importing those gliders from East Europe uh, and selling them cheaper than Schneider could, uh, uh, could produce the, the kookaburra. So... Uh, and it's still used. That that glider is is with my club as a as a primary trainer uh, to this day. Um, it's a very durable aircraft, of course. Uh, and an interesting thing there is what what that guy's doing there is um, is holding it level on the wheel, uh, just with aileron uh, in a reasonable breeze on the nose. Um, it it's a fun thing you can do in a glider. Uh, that's some of our one of our students with a with a, a glider, which is uh, still finding use in all sorts of things. Uh, that's the uh, the Blanix with an X B L A N I X Red Bull team, yeah, in Austria. Um, they do things that we may consider doing, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting one. Yes, you got one airplane as well. Yeah, so, okay, that, that sequence they've done, and there's a video. You, if you do Red Bull Blanix with an X, you'll find this video and others. So the two gliders launch simultaneously, uh, Skydiver in the back cockpit of, of the lower one. Um, he opens the canopy, slides out onto the wing, while the other one is rolling inverted and positioning above. Uh, and then he stands, and they've got a... Uh, something for him to hold on to, uh, stands on the wing and they come in and they connect the two gliders. Uh, and then, then the skydiver drops off and the gliders come in and uh, the way it's shown in the video, they all come back to terra firma together. They, you know, they, they kind of land in formation and he's already there and there's lots of high fives. Very Red Bull, but uh, uh, I find it interesting. Now... Back in Australia, Bill Riley, who established his uh, sport avia company at uh, Tuckenwell, uh, he was a pretty entrepreneurial guy and uh, they, they were selling Blanix hand over fist. Um, and they even did this one off motorized Blanix. That's the work of a guy I was with on the airfield today. There, Bert Person. Uh, he worked for Bill Riley for a number of years. Uh, long time. Uh, he's typical of, he came out from Sweden in the early 50s. Um, and he tells me the story of uh, when he went flying with the Alice Springs Gliding Club. He was going for a check flight with the CFI um, and he felt a thermal. So he started, he pulled into the thermal and the CFI told him to stop doing that nonsense. Uh, and they landed after a very short flight. Second flight, he found another thermal. And this time when the CFI said, what are you doing? He said, just watch me. And it became obvious to him that this CFI of a gliding club had never climbed in a thermal. He introduced thermaling to, to uh, 
um, uh, to Alice Springs. But working for Bill Riley, um, there, there, there were many stories from these days. They were, they were delivering the Blannocks. They had them brought out in packing cases. Uh, those packing cases they sold to, um, uh, uh, as, to be used as fishing huts around the, uh, the Murrumbidgee, I believe. Um, and they, uh, they were aero towing for delivery to clubs. He aero towed from Tokenwall to Alice Springs and he has been to Tasmania twice in his life, both times by Blanick. Aero towed behind an oster, I think it was. Um, and uh, I've got a personal uh, thing with the Blanick. I still train people in it. That's me on my first solo. And we still fly Blanicks for um, Warbird joy flights. Warbird, you say? Yep. It served as a trainer for the Soviets and the United States. So it actually is a warbird. And it even served with uh, Australian air cadets, um, but uh, that was many years ago. They are still using gliders. That's a DG 1001. And um, those cadets, the ones in the middle and the instructors, they are all members of my club. Uh, that's how I got that photo. There was another aircraft, an East European metal that, uh, that Bill brought in that was not as big as the Blanick, but pretty significant. And that's the IS-28, which is still the signature image of the uh, Caboolture Club uh, and a very nice aircraft. And that particular aircraft, Charlie Quake Charlie, um, was sold to our club by Bert, who brought it over from Alice Springs. Uh, and that's Bert now, that's today, this morning on his AFR with our CFI, 86 years old and still flying. <coughs> but the reason I've got Bert there is not just for the personal connection. He was part of um, what we could call the last great exploit of this era that I'm talking about from the 50s to the 80s. Um, Bill Riley was bringing in three um, IS-28Ms. That's the motorised version of, of the... 28. And it was 1981. Uh, and he got a $14,000 quote to uh, ship these gliders uh, from Romania, where they were built, by the way, in a factory um, that used to build in the 1940s, ME 109s for, for the Luftwaffe. Um, they decided that they would not ship these out, they'd fly them from Romania to Australia. <laughs> yep, and they did. Absolutely. Three pilots, um, Bill Riley, Bill Schoon, and Bert Person. But that's not Bert there, because that's on arrival in Australia. Um, well, they got to Malaysia after some hair-raising uh, flights. They had a the, um, the spare seat was filled with fuel tank. Everything was crammed in. The pilot relief system was hot water bottles that they peed into. Um, had the story of their flight is, is epic. Uh, but they got to Butterworth and were treated like royalty by the uh, RAAF there. Uh, <coughs> and they were there for a while because um, they'd been held up on the, on the road route uh, a bit. And... Um, uh, Bert was due to fly back to Sweden to compete in the Swedish nationals. So they had 14 days in, uh, in Malaysia waiting for Bert to come back. So they were, they were being right royally treated by the uh, RAAF to the point that Bert, he was wondering, he only, by the time they got there, and had a couple of days to, uh, to organise his flight over to Stockholm. And he wasn't sure how he was going to get to the, uh, to the international airport. And uh, I, I think it was the squadron CEO they were talking to said, don't worry, he jumped on the phone and a helicopter landed outside. And <laughs> that's how Bert, he said they landed him at the steps on the tarmac of the 747 and he did the paperwork <laughs> on the way up. Uh, but where this guy comes in is uh, they couldn't wait any longer for Bert to get back. They, they had visas and, and permits expiring. So they had to fly them on. And um, that's Bill Barrett 
who was a leading aircraftman at Butterworth and a GFA instructor. So, One of those three in Alice Springs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was that 81. 81. Yeah, they do mention going to Alice on the way to Toke and then uh, ultimately to Melbourne. Hmm? They took a lot of runway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they would have been full too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, I, you know, I think that uh, that and the, uh, and the platter boys to me are like the end of a, of a, a great golden era um, in Australian gliding where, yes, there was adventure. There's still adventures, but they're a little bit more tame than, than that now. Um, okay. And there's a reason I chose this slide to uh, go into the, the last part of my talk, which is about uh, how gliding differs from other forms of flying. Um, but Bird has a connection with that. That's at Caboolture, actually. That's a Blanick wing, of course. And uh, that was, um, that in itself is a significant aircraft. The, um, yeah, the uh, Gypsy Moth, yeah, which belongs, it'll be out on that display for sure. Uh, because in, nine, in the 1930s, it set a new record for uh, England, Australia flight, uh, broke uh, Hinkler's record. Uh, and Bert, is the man responsible for a large part of the final restoration of that aircraft. Uh, so things come around together from time to time. Okay, so how is gliding different from, us, from other forms of aviation? Well, as we established early on, you need an awful lot of people to get one glider pilot in the air. So uh, right from the beginning, it's been a much more social form of flying than, uh, than uh, you know, just going out to the hangar opening and, and pushing the aircraft out. So uh, the Americans tried other ways of, <laughs> but I don't think that lasted. Um, so from Bungie, Winch uh, was the next development in, uh, and you still need a lot of people. When you think about all this, uh, you know, there's someone sitting in the cockpit to take off. You need someone to run the wing, someone to run the winch, someone to communicate between them. Uh, yep. Yeah. And um, that's a winch if no one's ever seen it. Simply uh, a drum and a big engine. Uh, in those days, it was fencing wire um, running from one end of the airfield to the other. And um, the glider kiting against the winch. Um, at a fairly uh, high rate of climb. Uh, 1,500 to 2,000 feet is probably a reasonable range to expect for a, a release off winch. Um, whatever it is, you get there in about 45 seconds from standing start, which is uh, uh, a buzz. If no one's done it, I know you guys have. But... And uh, if you thought winches looked fairly primitive back in the day, they still do. <laughs> That's actually at Bond Springs. The main difference is now, instead of wire, it's dyne-on rope. Uh, but still, not just in Australia, but all around the world, aerotow is, uh, is by far the most common form of, uh, of getting a glider in the air. And it, it's physical. That's Jenny Goldsmith there. And I think that's Dave in the... Uh, in the K6. Uh, and for the benefit of uh, people who may not have seen a gliding launch, that's not just for balance, that's a signaling device for, that's got a flag for the tug pilot uh, to take up slack and full power. Goes back to the days before radio, but it's still handy to not clog up radio to, to do that. So, it follows that uh, we get used to flying fairly closely with other aircraft right from the start as a student. Uh, again, an aerotow, it's not quite as exciting as a, as a winch launch, but it, it is, think about it, it's formation flying and it's a tail chase. So the glider pilot is, is basically doing what these um, display pilots are doing in their warbirds at air shows, uh, all the way up to the, uh, to the point of release. And even then, you still feel like you're in a dogfight. Um, and dual towing. 
that's, that's something that uh, is not very often used, mainly, and in that case, it's to ferry gliders from one point to another. Uh, again, you need a huge team of people to get a, a dual tow uh, going. Uh, and what gets really interesting about that is that there's a much higher level of concentration demanded on all three pilots, uh, especially when you're going over tiger country, which is if you're ferrying, that's one of the few occasions when you can expect to be behind a glider tug and, uh, and uh, potentially somewhere which would not be comfortable. And typically the East Europeans have taken this, um, this uh, aero towing, uh, multiple towing, to extremes. I think they've set a world record with nine or 10 gliders oh. behind one <laughs> aircraft. Again, you can see that on YouTube. Um, what are they towing with? Yep. The reason for the AN2 there is that there is a story from, uh, from the land of the 80s, the fall of the uh, Soviet Empire. The Swedes had a, uh, an international competition and they had entries on paper from some of the Baltic states, but they weren't sure whether they'd get there because, you know, money and uh, uh, bureaucracy, it was, they were serious impediments. Uh, so they, they had these guys registered, but they hadn't turned up yet and they, they thought they weren't going to until on the eve of the competition, the Swedish Air Force was scrambled to intercept a close formation of four coming across the sea towards them from the east. It was one of these towing three gliders. Uh, and they, they, the pilot had failed to mention in his flight plan that he'd have something behind him. <laughs> um, and I believe the, uh, the, the second part of that story was the uh, AN2 was a good choice because they didn't have currency, they didn't have hard currency, but they landed with that thing loaded to the plimsoll with uh, black market caviar and uh, <laughs> vodka. And uh, may have even made a profit on the comp. Um, the other way of getting um, uh, up in the air is to, uh, uh, you know, to put a motor in and motorize the glider. That actually, that one is a K14, which is the motorized version of the K6. Um, and it has a, a little two-stroke, uh, I believe it actually started life as a chainsaw motor, German, and on the panel, there is the, uh, the, the wooden handle, yeah, start it like a Victor, with a feathering prop, of course. Uh, further development of that idea, the, uh, what's called the touring motor glider, uh, which is really a hybrid, uh, you know, can cruise as a, as a powered aircraft at 90, 100 knots. Uh, and uh, when you feather the prop and close down, uh, it has maybe a 28 to one ratio, which is somewhat similar to, uh, to the Blanick. So it's a reasonable two seat uh, glider to fly and enjoyable. Uh, then the self launches, which are now, um, electric, those dorsally mounted ones, that actually is, is an electric one, which is currently available on the market. Um, and the latest thing, which is, I think, probably the most exciting development is called FES, uh, Front Electric um, Self-Launch or Sustainer. So the, um, the, the prop blades, they fold back and centripetal force flips them out. When you, when you fire it up and then they automatically fold back again. So it's just an electric motor in, in that uh, there and batteries wherever. And I think these, the people have even started retrofitting those to, uh, to other gliders. Uh, I guess the big, the big thing is uh, how much clearance you've got for, for the prop. But things like that and solar are probably the, the future of gliding and maybe ultimately that may make gliding less social. Uh, but where we are at the moment is we're still towing gliders around airfields, retrieving them with cars, putting the dollies on. So even getting a glider after it's, after it's uh, landed is, is a social event. Uh, and lots of people are involved. The pie cart, that's what we call it in Australia. It, around the world, the, the mobile flight base is, is, uh, is the mark of a gliding operation um, where, you know, the, the, uh, the flights are 
maintain the, the day is run. And it's, it's a social centre in itself um, because gliding is a day. You don't go out for an hour. You go for a day or a half day, which is a big advantage for people like this who are all enjoying each other's company. A disadvantage for people like that who are young and don't have a lot of time. Uh, I, you know, it's the, the social side of gliding is also its Achilles heel, uh, which is where I, I'm maybe seeing a future in the, in the FES. But it's still getting people because it's interesting, that's at my club. Um, of all the people there, you can see that mostly they're older, uh, but even the older ones, there are only two there who are long-term, i.e. more than 20 years in the club. Uh, some of the older ones here are um, one to five years. So we are still getting people coming into gliding. And it's not just on tow. We fly in close company with other aircraft. You get used to it. Um, I like that. That's another fighter pilot feel. And it's not just aircraft. Because we don't make noise, we attract birds. Um, that's, that's one of my favourite times. That's at Caboolture. Uh, flying with a mate, he was flying at the time. I, I looked down on the first turn, we're, we're in the thermal, and the dump is full of ibis. And I said, oh, there's three or four ibis coming up to join us. They were right under us. On the second turn, all of them are coming up. And they did. They didn't come, they didn't fly past or surround us. They kept their distance, but, you know, flying like that is one of the magic, magic things. I saw you had a thermal, so I joined you in the thermal. That's it, exactly, yeah. Talk about flying in a the thermal. That's, um, that's obviously not a normal day, that's competition flying. The, uh, the start of a gliding competition gets very interesting in the air because everyone's uh, waiting for the start. And the, you know. So I count 12 aircraft there and uh, there would be more because there'd be others that are out of that camera or above or below. Um, and if you think it's crowded on the, in the air, that's, that's a starting grid on a small competition. Um, you've got maybe 50 gliders and five or six tugs. And the, uh, the tugs are coming in on a parallel landing on a parallel runway, and it's, it's a well-oiled machine. There are uh, multiple crews. You need uh, people to hook up, to run the wing, to get the, to get the rope. Uh, it's the closest that I can imagine in civilian flying to the action on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. And I've been there. I've been there as a pilot, and I've been there in the crews doing the running, and it is very exciting because you're trying to get 50 or 60 or 20, whatever the number is, gliders into the air in as many minutes or less. So uh, it's, uh, that's really exciting. Also exciting when you're flying in competitions, um, not just competitions, but more likely that, the outlanding, which is a normal part of gliding. If you did that in a powered aircraft, um, you'd be uh, reporting to uh, the powers that be. In a glider, it's accepted as normal. Uh, and here's a confession, that's my outlanding. And that's not me in the depths of despair. It's uh, me up to my uh, armpits in the glider, disconnecting the uh, flight controls to take the wings off and get them back into a hangar, into a, a trailer. And that's the other great distinguishing mark of, uh, of any airfield where there are glider ops is trailers. And even then, at the trailer, lots of people. Even getting into the hangar, still lots of people because they're large objects and they're not easy to move. And that's a typical gliding club hangar on a normal, typical gliding club day. Go to a regatta and it goes up a notch or two. So to the final thing, and we're on the, one of the last strokes now, why did I come flying I run, uh, to fly gliders, which was in uh, 2006, after a long time away. Ironically, it's, um, it's because of something that only did not exist prior to the end. It, it, its existence coincides with um, 
with the end of that golden era I was talking about, the 80s. And it is that. That's the morning glory roll cloud up in the Gulf of Carpentaria, which was first flown, first discovered by glider pilots, by a couple of pilots from Byron Bay in uh, sometime in the 80s. And they were doing it, flying in a touring motor glider and um, happened to talk to some locals and said, oh, you might see one of these things. And uh, they went back and told everyone and no one believed them. They thought they'd been on drugs. Uh, to give you an idea, see that? That's one of those 17 meter or more motor gliders. And it's energy that is almost endless. So um, how it, um, the theory on, on the, uh, the glory is that uh, it happens, we're just past glory time, September, October, onset of the, uh, of the monsoon in North Queensland. Um, you get moist air from the Coral Sea and moist air from the Gulf of Carpentaria colliding over the spine of Cape York. And if the conditions are right, the air descends, it starts to roll into that, that long cotton wool roll. Um, and it, um, it comes across the, uh, the Gulf and lands in the area of Burketown. Uh, at usually at about sunrise. Hence, it's been known to the locals as the morning glory for years, but it's uh, only been uh, used by uh, motor glider flight. And motor gliders, the only practical way to go there is in a glider that you can fly there yourself or drive up in a trailer. And that's a long drive because uh, I'm in one of those gliders. I can't remember which one. Uh, it is a long way from anywhere. Mm -hmm. The centre of, uh, of morning glory flying uh, when it's on is Burketown, normal population 165. Um, we worked out, uh, some of the guys have flown there with that there are far fewer people who have flown on the morning glory than there are who have climbed to the uh, peak of Everest. Uh, because, you know, because of its remoteness. And the stories are true. The pub, the one bar in Burketown, glider pilots are looking at their beer for the level of frosting on the, on, the, uh, on the bottle and on the fridge. If you have a heavy frosting, heavy dew, go to bed early because there should be a glory in the morning. And then when you go out to the airfield before sunrise, uh, the wings are literally dripping with dew. Uh, you you wipe, wipe the wings off and they're wet before you've finished. Uh, so you're taking off in that, that condition. It's, it's quite an exciting thing to do. Um, and there is an indication of the energy that's just being sucked up and rolled over. Last day I flew on the Glory, which was some years ago, we, um, we had uh, seven of those waves which uh, we thought they'd arrived, they'd arrived early. We thought they, they were gone, but we actually did go over and, 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 and engaged on the first one over the land and worked it until uh, it died and then went to the next and the next and the next. And that was the most amazing couple of hours I've had for a, in the air. That's what it looks like for the pilot. Uh, and that is why I came gliding and why I continue to fly towards the sunrise. Uh, and I hope that by opening up to you some of the inner biggles in me, that's me, um, I may have opened some of the inner biggles in you. And there's some questions. <clears throat> uh, you, you mentioned that I, uh, uh, they've changed the tow rope. You get many oh, on the rides. cable yeah. uh, on the winch yeah oh yeah winch 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 launch uh just comes with rope breaks okay because yeah. i was going to say that was one of the, the bugbears of the wire winch launching was yeah you, you'd spend as you say you spend all day mm. and you're a worker and, and by the time wherever you are in the queue to go flying and there's been three or four cable breaks yes and then suddenly the weather comes good Somebody goes up and they don't come back, and that's the end of your end of your flying for the day. That was my experience in at Warwick in the late sixties, exactly. Um, but with the with the rope, there are fewer breaks, but you, you're still susceptible. 
Yeah. And the other thing is, um, uh, particularly at Kaibong at uh, Gympie, where they still occasionally use the winch, um, the, uh, uh, if there's too much crosswind, even with laying off, um, the, if, if the crosswind is too much, the, the line is going to go over into the next paddock, which is full of black snakes and burrs. And there's, there's not much incentive to continue flying in a crosswind. Up at, uh, up at Kingaroy, the, uh, uh, when the cable went down it, at the right time of the year, with all the uh, uh, peanuts that were still, still growing there, and, it, and they'd been stooped, and they, the cable would knock down all the stooks, and that was one of the jobs you had at the end of the day, oh, was really go cool. back, big line of people, reek stooking all, all the peanuts. <laughs> yeah, that would... And have you done car launches? As well? No, I haven't. I've, uh, I think they, 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 they have occasionally done it in recent years at Boona, but I've never even seen one. And I know out at Amberley, I think they used to do it. But uh, yeah, I've done yeah. some. Oh yeah, okay. That uh, a Pawnee. That's one of the issues at King Roy as well, isn't it? Now at Caboolture, I think it used to be King Roy. Uh, no, no, the one that was at King Roy. We've got our one is uh, Sierra Papar Alpha, which. Uh, as we've had for years, but we did have the King, King Roy X Cadets one. I forget it's uh, Rego. It went to Western Australia in in the last year or two. Uh, and Pawnees are, are the weapon of choice um, because of their power and and their flight envelope suits the most uh, gliding uh, towing flight requirements as well. As as is a two fifty horse um, and um, you need it to, uh, you know, to get up there through the traffic. Didn't yeah. Kingaroy use a re-engined Cessna? Yes. One? They've got a 150. I've yeah. launched behind that. I think it's a 150 with the 180 engine yeah. or something like that. that. That's what they've got at, at Kaibong at Gympie now as well. Um, and at Kingaroy, they they are also doing a uh, a Pawnee with a with an automotive engine, water cooled. Yeah, I think it's the same airplane. I flew the one where it had 150 horsepower uh, engine, but I understand it's been re engined with a, a car engine. Yeah. And of course, yeah. you've got the exchange, you don't have to nurse the engine. That, that's right. Yeah. On yeah. the way down. Yeah. Your yeah. cycle cool. time goes up considerably. Water cooled engines, much better yeah. for that. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the Olympics with um, yeah. your aircraft. Was it ever an Olympic sport? No, because the 1940 Olympics. That was its. Yeah. yeah. So is it right for the Queensland Olympics in the I doubt it. No. <laughs> How about the Paralympics? <laughs> it could be. I'd like to see it. Uh, the closest is there is a, um, a gliding competition, you know, like the Red Bull one where the, it's an elite thing and they've just got the circuit like Formula One. Um, and I forget what it's called, but it is more like Formula One where they're a glider. It's the same... 10 or 15 glider pilots who go around the world competing against each other and they've got cameras in the aircraft and cameras at, at the waypoints and, and trying to make it a television sport. Um, that's, the, that's the big problem with, with gliding as a, as a sport. It's not really a spectator sport because uh, these days a, a, a competition could easily have a 400 or, or so kilometre uh, triangle. So they just disappear. In the, no, Gone for hours. Similar. Yeah. 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 Similar challenges. I'm a sailor as well. Yeah. Yes, uh, Garrick. I've read about water ballast in yes. riders. Um, what's the purpose? Can you just explain how it's used? To increase the weight of the glider to uh, to give you better penetration to get so that you can fly faster and more efficiently between thermals to go from thermal to thermal. Um, and in fact, that, the, uh, that gull-winged aircraft that, uh, that uh, uh, Edmund Schneider designed in the 1930s, that's the first aircraft to have water ballast. It carried water ballast. In its case, it was in the fuselage, but uh, the modern gliders have um, bladders in the wings and uh, and they load them up there's a lot of weight you can see them 
sagging and and of course you can't land with that amount of weight so when they come back from flying the uh, the task they um, they ditch the water like a crop duster they open the taps and to see these in particularly in the late afternoon coming in low and streaming the water out and then uh, going up and coming into land they do, you know doing competition finishes and that sort of thing that that is a spectator sport yeah yeah yeah. Them yeah, that's it. Yeah. I've got a story about that. But uh, there's a comp over at uh, uh, Kingaroy, and uh, there's high ground to the north of Kingaroy. So you have to keep above that and then burn the uh, height off with speed and release the water over Kingaroy. Next day, I was in, in the town, and I, um, he said, What are you doing here? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm in the gliding competition. He said, uh, Oh, he said, They came, some of them coming over yesterday, they're on fire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the best left drag ratio, and the heavier you are, the faster you go on the often lift drag ratio. And so you're going to get between one yeah. thermal to another. You've got the penetration to get over there, um, not taking so much time, not losing as much altitude overall. Yeah. Well, that, for example, that little K6, which is a beautiful little aeroplane to fly. But uh, the joke among the, uh, the Tupperware pilots, Tupperware is what we call the plastic gliders, uh, is, uh, you know, K6 downwind is not an option because they don't have penetration uh, and they don't have the capacity to add water. So, One more question while you're being recorded. Uh, I'm from Raff Ambly Aviation Heritage Centre uh -huh. and I know nothing about the aircraft other than my question. Uh, we have a Blanick donated to us uh, mm -hmm. from somewhere up on the downs. I don't know anything about it, but do you know anything about um, it? Not specifically, but it's probably from Darling Downs uh, Soaring, uh, DDSC Soaring Club. Yeah. Um, there may have been in the past other other clubs up there. Could have been from Kingaroy, but there are... I think it, it had some time in its past at Ambly, based at Ambly. That's oh, yeah, well, they, they did have flying at Ambly. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there, there were... Um, thousands of Blanix built. I don't know whether I told you the figure. I think it's, uh, it's something like over 2,000 around the world. Um, and the Blanick uh, suffered uh, some years ago, a couple of guys doing aerobatics in an old Blanick in uh, Austria, um, parted company with their wings. Uh, and that, that, uh, uh, that led to the grounding of, of Blanix uh, and ADs that came out the way um, it was metal fatigue, the aircraft were getting old, uh, and uh, you could not fly a Blanick unless it had been suitably modified. In Australia, that had been recognised as a problem as far back as the 80s, and a guy in Toowoomba, Dafford Llewellyn, um, developed a mod um, called the Llewellyn Mod. Um, and not very many gliders had that mod applied because the clubs at the time didn't see it as economically viable. Uh, the Blanics that we still fly, they're both um, uh, with the Llewellyn modification, the mod, and, and they are no longer the, the standard one is the L13, LET L13 Blanick. Um, these are now their L13A1. So it's actually a, 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 a type variant. Uh, and I don't know what the, like the Blanix guys in Austria, what they've done, but they'd have to have some modification to satisfy EASA. Oh, this one is not flying. Yeah, so. that's why a lot of Blanix uh, were, um, you know, were donated. Uh, there's an Air Force Museum in Western Australia which we were in a couple of years ago. And I think that there's a blank just sitting there. And I, I was, and it's the most beautifully, beautifully uh, preserved blank I've seen. And I was asking, and they didn't know anything about it. I said, oh. Well, I'm quite happy to take it as long as I don't have to polish it. Is it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've had enough of that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's an interesting story on that same front with uh, uh, the IS-28, that other aircraft. When that was built in Romania, in uh, they, um, they, the, uh, the, the, uh, the certificate, the certification, gave that aircraft a life in years, not hours, not flying time, years, thirty-five years, uh, regardless of of use or non-use. 
And uh, so there came a time a few years ago where they were disappearing out of service um, because they'd run out of time. Uh, someone in Europe came up with not a modification, it didn't require modification, but they came up with a formula of paperwork uh, and you can pay them the fee. And, uh, and we did that with that glider, uh, the one we have. So Was that because they calculated that the fiberglass would deteriorate over a certain time? I don't know, I, 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 uh, because the, the company then went out of business and you know, uh, don't really know what, what it was. But, but fiberglass, that's an interesting thing that fiberglass definitely not just killed wood, but it killed metal. Uh, I did have some slides I was going to show you earlier of uh, from a vintage rally, um, Russian metal gliders that are just from the 60s, just beautiful, beautiful things. And a friend of mine at Kabulja has one, the only one outside of the US, outside of North America, uh, Schweitzer, which is uh, an American glider company, a bit like, um, and they were metal. And uh, it's, it's uh, somewhat similar, a little single seater, beautiful little aircraft that was competing in the 1970 comps, I think. And it was not competitive against fiberglass. So that company, that company Schweitzer now is a, um, it still exists as a brand, but it makes helicopter components, I think. Something like that. Well, if there are no more questions, I'll might run it up now. Certainly, it's given me a punt, I'd better go and do a bit more gliding. <laughs> <laughs> Mission and, accomplished then. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll hop up to Kabulsha again. I haven't, yeah. I haven't glided from Kabulsha before, we've glided in other places. But uh, thank you very much, and uh, it's been a very interesting. I hope, I hope you actually enjoyed it. Right. Thank, thank you. you.